And we're live. Good day, everyone back there in the Philippines. Good evening here from South Carolina, USA. This is Coach Mac of Gurung Pinoy. We are very glad that you're able to join us today in our live stream for our LET review. Um, now, please do make sure that you like this video. You subscribe to our YouTube channel, Gurung Pinoy, if you haven't done so yet. Also, like and follow our Facebook page, that's still Gurung Pinoy. Please share our Facebook page also, our YouTube channel, so that we can help more teachers or more teachers in the future pass the lead. We are also in Instagram, that's Gurung Pinoy PH. So we are also going to welcome it if you can follow us on Instagram. Now, we appreciate all the comments and suggestions that you have been giving us. Um, I will try my best to discuss everything that you have suggested in our coming videos. So make sure that you continue watching all of the videos that we've prepared for you. Okay, so this video are also going to be very helpful in you passing the lab in the future, even your friends who are going to be taking the lab. So please make sure that you subscribe, hit the like button, also hit the uh, bell notification button and you share our channel to all of your friends who will be taking the lab in the future. Okay, now in this live stream, I'd like you to please stay interactive, say hi if you're here, and also don't forget to leave your comments so that we'll know that you're all watching our videos, okay? Um, as you know, I am a teacher here in South Carolina, and if it's not for COVID, I will not be able to put up and maintain this channel. So I'm very glad to be of service to all of you, and I will make sure that I can I would help you pass the lab. So before coming here in South Carolina, we had a review center, what which was located in Iloilo City. It was called Study Link Review and Tutorial Center. And we still have ample of materials that can help you pass the lab. So make sure again that you hit that subscribe button, like this video, say hi so that I'll know that you're here and that I would be inspired in discussing this topic that we have. Okay, now we'll go straight to our topics today. Again, our topics today are all very relevant in your lab, are all very helpful. So make sure that you stay with me and that you don't stop watching this video, okay? All right, now let me go to our topics today. Okay, so today's topic are the foundations of education. And the foci of today's discussion are going to be the following. We will be talking about the philosophical foundations of education in the Philippines, the religious foundations, also the social foundations, the history of the Philippine education, and of course, the relevant laws in Philippine education. Now, I will not be dealing really uh, in depth with the philosophical uh, philosophical foundations of education because we already have a video on this. If you haven't watched it yet, then make sure that you watch that video. The title of the video is The Isms of Education. You can see the thumbnail there. That's also part of our playlist for professional education. If you haven't checked our playlist yet, make sure that you check all the videos there because we have already prepared all the videos there of different discussions. We which are all part of the licensure exam for teachers. We also have some videos for general education, so make sure that you also check that playlist. So again, I will not be dealing in depth with all the philosophical foundations of education since we already have a previous video, a separate video for this. Okay, but again, remember that we have so many philosophical foundations in our education. I've only listed the five major ones here. Essentialism, you already know that it's topic when you say essentialism, it's only dealing with the basics. It is only teaching the students with the basics, the three R's. What are these three R's that we have? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. Sometimes they may add the fourth R, which is right conduct. Okay, so that's essentialism. Essentialism is also a very traditional form of um, education, educating, educating our students. Okay, so in essentialism, the teacher is considered to be the fountain of knowledge and the paragon of virtues. The teacher knows everything. Okay, so the teacher is the only source of knowledge in essentialism. So again, essentialism, it's talking about basic only teaching the basic, not teaching a lot of things to your students, and also the teacher as the authority inside the classroom, the teacher as the only source of knowledge in your room. Okay, now number two here for our 
philosophical foundation of education, we have behaviorism. Now, the behaviorist would argue that they can mold the students into anyone that they'd want the students to be. They can make policemen, they can make engineers, they can make doctors, they can make teachers, they can even make criminals, okay? It all depends on how they put up or how they control the environment of the student. So in behaviorism, the environment of the student plays a very important role in its education, okay? So that's behaviorism. Under this, you have so many things. You have the conditioning, you have classical conditioning by Ivan Pavlov. I've also talked about this in um, one other video that we have. So when you say classical conditioning by Ivan of love, it's always dealing with phobia and trauma. See, if you see questions in the lab talking about phobia and trauma, and if the lab is asking you to name that type of foundation or to name that type of school of thought, your answer would automatically be behaviorism. Now, there is another conditioning which is called operant conditioning, and that is by B.F. Skinner. So for B.F. Skinner, what's important is reward and punishment, feedback, Okay, that's also part of Skinner. Reinforcement, that's also part of uh, his theory. And also another thing is computer-aided instruction. Okay, so reward punishment, these are all part of behaviorism under operant conditioning by B.F. Skinner. Now, the third one that we have here is existentialism. The, our existentialists would argue that the student should have the freedom to choose what he or she would want to be. But in terms of freedom, if the student has the freedom to choose whatever it is that he'd want to become, he also has to face the repercussions. He also has to face all the consequences of that choice. Okay, So the freedom and responsibility, that's for existentialism. The fourth one that we have here is perennialism. Again, I've also mentioned this in one of our previous videos. Videos. When you say perennial, it means forever. Okay, so perennialism, it means forever, which means that your perennialists would argue that whatever methods of teaching that they had in the past, those methods of teaching that were very successful, those methods of teaching, those ways of teaching that were very effective, are still effective up to this moment. Okay, so that's for your perennialists. Now, the last one here is one of the most modern ways of teaching our kids, teaching our students, and that is progressivism. For your progressivists, they believe that learning is a lifelong process. Learning is not just a preparation for life, but learning is life, okay? So that's your progressivist point of view. They believe in um, the different types of intelligences. So multiple learning intelligences by Howard Gardner would fall under progressivism. But of course, the father progressivism would be John Dewey. Okay, now progressivists would also believe in different other things, different other ways of teaching your kids. So there's differentiated instruction. You don't just teach them in one method or in one way, not just all uh, by lecture, but you also make them dance, make them role play, make them play, make Make them do other stuff aside from lecture okay so differentiated instruction based on the needs of our students that's progressivism's point of view experimentalism okay so experimentation is also part of progressivism all right so these are the five philosophical foundations that i'm only going to discuss today because we have already have um the ism video which is also part of our playlist for professional education so again make sure that you check that video check all of the videos that we have in our prof ed playlist because those are all going to be very helpful for you, for you when you take the lab okay now we go to the next slide the next thing that we will discuss would be the different religious foundations that we've had the different influences based on religion that we had in our Philippine education, okay? So these are the six. We have Confucianism, there's Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Islam, and of course, Christianism. All right, so we start with the first one. The very first that we have here is Confucianism. This is an Eastern form of philosophy, which uh, later on also became a religion. So this was by Confucius, also known as Kung Fu Cho, also known as Kung Fu Che. So Confucius is also known as Kung Fu Cho and Kung Fu Che. They are all just the same person, okay? So don't be 
um, do not be uh, confused if you don't see Confucius, but you see Kung Fu Chu or Kung Fu Che in your choices. Okay, so Confucius would still be Kung Fu Chu and Kung Fu Che. All right, now what else? Confucius believed that all men are alike. Okay, so since they are all alike, uh, according to Confucius, they should all be educated alike. So there shouldn't be any social stratification in education. You shouldn't be teaching the rich kids in different ways than you are teaching the poor kids. You shouldn't be teaching those kids in rural areas different ways than those that you teach the, the kids in urban areas. Okay, so for Confucius, men, uh, men are all alike, men are the same and therefore they should be educated alike, okay? So in education, we should all be the same, okay? So that's according to Confucius. Now, Confucius also believed in the five basic relationships. What are these five basic relationships? And according to Confucius, if all the people would follow these five basic relationships, then our society is going to be a harmonious and it's going to be a peaceful society. Now, these five basic relationships, relationships that we have are those between father and son, leader and ruler, husband and wife, friend and friend, older brother and younger brother. Now, before I forget, if you can help it, and if you may, you can just get uh, a piece of paper or maybe your notebook every time that you listen to me discuss, even if you are watching a live stream or even if you are watching the usual videos that I upload, make sure that you have a piece of paper and a pen with you so that you can jot down all the important stuff that you need to jot down, okay? Everything that I'm talking about are coming out in the lab. I know this from my experience since we had a review center back then in Iloilo and we have helped very people pass the lab okay so we know how the lab works we know that all the questions in the lab are just recycled okay so that's why it's very important for you to subscribe to this channel make sure that you like this video and you follow all of our social media platform social media accounts because we know how the lab works and we can help you pass the lab okay you don't need to pay thousands of pesos for you to pass the lab okay so again the five basic relationships going back going back to Confucius and uh, for him, if you want to be a good leader, then you should also be a good example, okay? So being a good leader also means being a good follower, okay? So that's according to Confucius. Now, he also gave us the golden rule. You know what the golden rule is. Uh, do unto others what, you, what you'd want others to do unto you. Wag mong gawin sa iba ang ayaw mong gawin ng iba sa'yo, okay? So that's the golden rule. And that was also given to us by Confucius. And lastly, he also believed in religious rituals and conformity. This part right here would often come out in the lab, okay? So sometimes the lab would ask you, religious rituals are sometimes part of education in various societies, especially in Eastern countries. Whose thought was this or whose influence was this? So then if that's the question, your answer would be Confucius. If there's no Confucius, you can find Kung Fu Cho. If there's no Kung Fu Cho, then find Kung Fu Che. Okay, so again, Confucius is one of the most popular men or philosophers or educators and leaders in China, if not the most popular. And of course, if there's going to be a question in the lab about the greatest influence of Chinese education, if you will be asked that by the lab, if the question is, what is the major influence of Chinese education in all the education, all the societies all over the world, your answer would be the civil service examination. Okay, so civil service exams all started from Chinese education. Chinese education is also the longest form of education in the world. Okay, so that's Confucianism, the first religious uh, foundation that we have. We go to the next one, which is Buddhism. Okay, number two is Buddhism. This is by Siddhartha Gautama. Uh, the Buddhists believe in Buddha. Buddha is their supreme being. What else? They also believed in the Eightfold Paths. Now, very important here for you to take note would be meditation. Now, if we had rituals in Confucianism, medit meditation would under would fall under Buddhism. Don't be confused. The left might ask you about meditation, and then there's going to be choices like Confucianism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity. Of course, if it's meditation, your choice should be Buddhism. Okay, so don't, don't be confused. Meditation would be under Buddhism, while rituals would be under Confucianism. Okay, what else? 
they also believed in reincarnation okay so that's according to your buddhist they believe that you can be reincarnated you can be reborn several times um once you die you will be you you will have rebirth again okay so you will be reborn now for you to stop the reincarnation for you to stop being re reborn you should have everlasting peace lasting peace and their term for that one would be nirvana okay so they call that nirvana they believe in this and they believe that this is lasting peace okay so for reincarnation to stop you should have nirvana that's lasting peace being together with buddha okay so that's your buddhism now the third one that we have here is hinduism for them, Brahma is the supreme being. So if you have Buddha in Buddhism, you have Brahma in Hinduism. Vedas is their sacred texts. What else? They the, the Hindus believed in the caste system, which I will be discussing the next slide. Now they also believed in reincarnation and they believed in karma. Okay, so they believed in karma. What goes around comes around. Kung anong ginawa mo sa kapwa mo, ay babalik din sa yo. No, uh, it's almost the same with. Uh, the golden rule by Confucius. Okay, so uh, wag kang manluloko ng iba kung ayaw mong lokohin ka din ng iba. That's the rule of karma. So that's according to your Hindus. And if your Buddhist had nirvana as their lasting peace, for the Hindus, their goal of life is moksha. Okay, so uh, their goal of life, their their ultimate dream is to obtain or to to attain moksha. Okay, so that's for your Hindus. Now we go to your caste system. So this is the Indian caste system, your Hindus caste system. In this caste system or in this system, they have five different levels in your society. Okay, so they have five different stratifications. There's the Brahmins, the priests and the scholars, the Kshatriyas, your warriors and rulers. You also have the Vaishyas, your skilled traders, merchants, minor officials. Sudras are your unskilled workers and uh, the lowest would be your Pariahs. Your Pariahs are your outcasts, your untouchables, the children of God. Now, untouchables can be um, very common in the left, in your social studies. Untouchables would mean the lowest form or the the lowest stratification in your Indian Indian caste system. They are the ones who are doing the dirtiest jobs. They're the poorest of the poor. Okay, so that's your untouchables. That's according to your Indian caste system. Now, your Indian caste system, they believe that you cannot intermarry. Okay, so if you were born a pariah, you will live your life and you will die as a pariah. If you were born as a sudra, you will live your life and you were you are going to die as a sudra you cannot intermarry okay so you cannot marry someone who's a kshatriya or you cannot marry someone who's a vaisha all right so that's according to the indian caste system you are born in a certain stratification in your society certain level in your society you can only wear that uh those clothes that are accorded that level so you can't wear certain forms of jewelry that are not um allowed for your level to to wear and you are going to die also in that level. So walang improvement ang iyong life that's according to your Indian caste system. You cannot improve your life through education. You cannot improve your life through marriage. Okay, So you are born and you'll die in one level of your society. Okay, now we go to the fourth religious foundation that we have here, and this is Taoism. Okay, this is by Lao Tzu or Lao Che, the same person. They believe in Tao. Tao is the way. So when you say Tao, the way, this means being harmonious with uh, nature. Okay, so following the way of nature, following the way of nature. Don't change your faith. Don't change your law. Don't change your destiny. That's according to your Taoist. Uh, belief okay so just follow the way they also believe in the yin yang which is the balance of nature so if you obtain yin yang that means it's balanced okay nature is balanced there's harmony yin here is oftentimes considered as the bad side and yang is considered as the good side so if you have a combination of both of them the yin and the yang that means nature is in harmony okay there's balance so it does not mean that everything should always be good okay in life there would be bad times but there would also be good times there would be sour sour things and there there'd also be sweet things okay so that's according to your Taoist 
And very important, do not do anything that's against your destiny. Do not do anything that's against your, your luck or your fate. Just follow the way. Be in harmony with nature. Okay, now next one is Islam. This is, of course, the religion of our Muslim brothers and sisters. This was by their prophet Muhammad. Please be, uh, peace be upon him. Muhammad, sometimes called Muhammad with letter O, sometimes called Muhammad. Okay, the same person. And Allah is their supreme being. Uh, the Quran, the Holy Quran is their holy text. And they believe in the five pillars of the Muslim faith or the five pillars of Islam. Hajj is once in a lifetime you need to go or they need to go to uh, Mecca or to Medina to, to praise God or to praise Allah. Giving of charity, especially during Ramadan. Fasting during Ramadan, that's the third pillar. Salah is praying five times a day. I used to also teach in Saudi Arabia. I've taught there for two years from 2014 until, until 2016. And they've prayed, uh, the Muslim brothers and sisters that we had there, they pray five times a day okay so once they're praying we cannot do anything but wait for them to be done even if we are inside the mall we need to go out and to stay outside and wait for them to be done praying now the next one is shahada shahada is their declaration of faith to allah okay so these are the beliefs of our muslim brothers and sisters the, the beliefs of islam now, of course, one of the most popular religions, if not the most popular, is Christianity. And um, we have Christ in Christianity, we have Christ, of course, as the supreme being. The Bible is our holy text. We believe in the Ten Commandments. And of course, we also need to follow the seven sacraments. Seven sacraments, this would include baptism, um, confession, wedding, Okay, so these are all part of our seven sacraments. All right, so those are the religious foundations that we have. So we're done with philosophical foundations. Again, just find the video that we have here for the ISM, for the complete guide in philosophical foundations. Religious foundations, we're also done with this. So we still have the three foci that we have left here. So that's social foundations, history of Philippine education, and relevant laws in Philippine education. Again, if you're watching, Please say hi to me. Please leave your comments there, your suggestions, anything to let me know that you are still watching. If you'd want to support Gurung Pinoy, we also have our super chat and super stickers there. So um, go ahead and do that. So we'll continue. Again, we're done with the first two. We still have three, four, and five. So we go to the social foundations of education now, just very briefly. We start with the term socialization. Socialization is the process of being raised within a culture and acquiring the characteristics of that group. Okay, so socialization is how we learn our culture, how we learn the way of life of our people, how we learn pagmamano, how we learn pamamanhikan, how we learn how to um, how to greet our elders, for example. Okay, so that's socialization. And this is usually the first form of education that we give our kids. Okay, so they just socialize, they just observe, they just imitate whatever is happening in their society. So again, as teachers and as parents, it is very important for us to play role models to our kids and to our students. So remember, children see, children do. Okay, so sometimes you just be very amazed at what your child is going to speak or uh, at what your child says, because uh, little did you know it, your child has already um, imbibed the things that you were saying. The child, your child has already being influenced by all the people around him okay so be very wary be very careful when you're talking around kids and when you're acting around kids okay because they're very sensitive they're very absorbent they're like sponges they can easily follow and imitate whatever it is that they see the adults are doing Okay, now culture, according to our social dimensions, it can be transmitted by three ways. Okay, the first way that we have here is enculturation. Enculturation is just learning your own culture. Now, common questions in the lab um, for number one, enculturation, there are certain questions in the lab like, um, you live in an agricultural part or you, you live around coconut plantations and your father is teaching you how to make copra okay what 
form of transmission of culture is shown here. Another form of question that you can, you can find in the lab based on enculturation is that you live near the sea and your, your parents are fishermen. One day, your father taught you how to make shrimp paste. Okay, tinatawag po natin shrimp paste is bagoong. Okay, so what form of cultural transmission is this? Your answer then would be enculturation. Okay, so that's enculturation, learning your own culture. Paano ka nag-learn ng pagmamano? Paano ka nag-learn ng uh, um, saying the rosary, for example? Okay, um, the angelus. These are all part of our culture and these are all transmitted through enculturation. When we learn our own culture. The second form of cultural transmission would be acculturation. When you say acculturation, this is learning some parts of another culture. Now, this is very uh, popular right now. This is very uso in the Philippines since we have all been addicted to K-dramas. Okay, so many of you have been addicted to um, crash landing on you, uh, other dramas with uh, different opas that you have. And then you have tried learning some parts of their culture, like you, you're you also making the finger hard. What else? You, you can also speak some words from the Korean language. So if you try to learn, or once you start Start learning some parts of another culture, then that is called acculturation. Okay, so that's acculturation, learning some parts of another group's culture. Now, the last one that we have here is assimilation. Assimilation would mean the losing, losing your own culture and acquiring another culture. So say you have migrated here in the United States and you have completely forgotten how to speak Tagalog or how to speak Filipino, how to speak your dialect. You have completely forgotten all the parts of the Filipino culture and you have completely embraced the culture of the Americans. Okay, So once you've done that, then that method of transmitting culture is called assimilation. Okay, so these are the three different ways through which culture may be transmitted. Enculturation, learning your own culture. Acculturation, learning some parts of another culture but not losing your own culture. And the last one is assimilation. That means losing your own culture and acquiring another culture. Okay, so these are again the three ways of transmitting culture. Now we go to our social uh, foundations. Okay, now uh, the last part, the last word that we have here is indoctrination. This would also come out in the left. What is the meaning of the term indoctrination? This means teaching someone to fully accept an idea or belief, even if that person did not completely or does not completely understand your idea or belief, you are just forcing it to that person. Okay, so usually indoctrination is a word that is related or that is associated with the terrorists. Okay, forgive me for using the word, but this is the way of transmitting culture or transmitting ideas, ideals, beliefs um, to the young rebels that we have. Okay, so tinasabing, for example, pag yung mga uh, Abu Sayyaf eh, in inculturate yung kanilang mga bata, the, the young soldiers, the child soldiers that they have, they call that indoctrination. Okay, they're trying to teach someone to fully accept an idea or a belief. Okay, now we start with the different social influences that we have. The first one here is Greek influence. Greek here would have two parts. The first one is Athens. Secondly, we have Sparta. Okay, now what's the difference between Athens and Sparta? These are all uh, both two parts of Greek. Okay, Athens and Sparta are two places in Greece and they have greatly influenced education all over the world. Okay, now Athens they believed in holistic education. They they believed in educating the mind, the body, and the soul of a student. Okay, so holistic education, educating the whole child. That's the belief of your Athenian people. Uh, tutoring also started with Athens. Okay, so as you can see here, you have some very famous philosophers. Most of them are Greeks. You have Aristotle, Plato, Socrates is also Greek. Okay, so these are all people coming from Athens. Holistic education, educating the whole child, the mind, body, and soul, and also the beginning of tutoring. All right, what else? Now, the second part of Greek education is Sparta. If your Athenian people wanted to educate the whole person, the whole child, the mind, body, and soul, Spartan education is only focused on military training. So if you happen to watch... 
if you have watched the movie 300 okay so you had your spartan military there so sparta mainly focused on military military training so common question in the lab would be what really uh what what influenced the teaching of military training or the formation of military training all over the world your answer would be sparta okay that's sparta do not answer greek if you have the choice which is sparta because sparta would be more specific okay next one you have roman education roman education their goal was to develop is uh, develop civic responsibility so they wanted to form citizens who are responsible okay so that's civic responsibility and that's the influence of roman education okay so they wanted someone who can be a really good citizen someone who's go going to be very helpful in their society okay so development of civic responsibility that's roman education all right, so that finishes our social foundations. We're, we're done with philosophical foundations, religious foundations, the six religions that we have there, social foundations, the different factors that we have uh, and the different cultural transmission that we had. So that ends our focus number three. Now we have the two other foci that we have, history of Philippine education and the different relevant laws in Philippine education. We start with number four. These are the different parts that we are going to discuss, the pre-Spanish era, the Spanish, First Republic, American period, Commonwealth, Japanese, Third Republic, the new society, and the post-EDSA part of our Philippine education. Okay, so without further ado, let's go check the pre-Spanish era. Okay, now, according to our history, history in Philippine education, during the pre-Spanish era, education was very informal okay they didn't have any structure structures yet there was really no school yet no sections no um curriculum of any type okay so education was very informal by then those that would be teaching kids are the tribal tutors okay so they only have tutors in their tribes now what else their main focus was survival. So during this time, their existence was only based on the hand-to-mouth existence. Okay, so the main focus would be for survival. And um, their method of learning would be by show and tell, by imitation. So again, very informal form of education. It's only taught by the tribal tutors and their focus was by survival. So they were taught how to catch fish, how to kill boars, for example, how to plant. Okay, so very informal form of education that was during the pre-Spanish era. Now, when the Spanish came, our religion became very, really, uh, our, our education, I mean, became very religious. So the focus shifted to religious education. It was to promote Christianity, of course. And the method of teaching was by dictation and memorization. Now, remember that the Spanish did not really want us to learn their language. Okay. They, they were the ones who were learning Tagalog. Okay. They didn't really want the Indios. They called the, the Filipinos back then the Indios. They didn't really want the Indios to learn Spanish because they were scared that the Indios would be able to understand them when they're talking. Okay, so basically what they used was um, Tagalog and some people would also use Spanish from time to time. Okay, so the religion, uh, education shifted to religion and the main focus was to promote Christianity. Two methods of teaching the kids were dictation and memorization. Now, during the First Republic, during the time of Emilio Aguinaldo, the love of country and the love of God were given emphasis uh, education became less religious, so the focus was now less on religion because, of course, the Spanish people were gone. Um, it lacked pedagogy, so there was really no technique yet, no strategies, no curriculum of some sort. But there was already a system of free and compulsory elementary education, which was established by the Malolos Constitution. Okay, so we will be talking more of this in our next focus, okay, the, the last focus that we have. All right, so that's according to the First Republic under General Emilio Aguinaldo, okay, the first uh, president of the Republic, the First Republic of the Philippines. Now, next one, during the American regime, 
the focus of education was already towards democracy. They used English as the medium of education, the medium of instruction. It was now formal education. Okay, so education has now become formal. It has shifted to becoming formal. And they established the first public school system. Okay, so this is the common question in the left. Who established the first public school system or the public school system in the Philippines? Your answer is going to be the Americans. Okay, so that's during the American period. And of course, they used various methods of teaching, which now included debates and games. Okay, so that's during the American period, American regime. We go to the next one, Commonwealth period. Now, common question in the lab, uh, during the Commonwealth period, what could be said about the government or about the country of the Philippines? Your answer there would be, we were partially independent. So we were not fully independent during the Commonwealth period. We were also not under the, the American rule, but we were partially independent because the Americans were um, making us ready to become independent, okay? Of course, our president during the Commonwealth period was Manuel Quezon, okay? Now, Again, the focus was preparation for independence, as I've mentioned, because the U.S. was trying to teach us how to become independent. There's promotion of nationalism. The Filipino language was used because, of course, we are going to be independent soon. And we already are trying to um, patronize or trying to use our language. Okay, And it started the CAT or the citizenship advancement training that we have in um, schools. Okay, so that's during the Commonwealth period. Now, next one is the Japanese regime. Um, the Japanese period, their focus was the love of labor. Okay, so what was given emphasis was tech voc, technical vocational. The love of labor was given emphasis. Also, the eradication of dependence on Westerners. So the Japanese people wanted us to be influence and wanted us to be dependent on our asian brothers okay so they said we are all asians do not be dependent on the americans do not be dependent on the spanish okay that, so that's during the japanese period they used nihongo in teaching the kids okay so the medium of instruction was nihongo uh, of course another thing that you need to remember here our president during that time was um Jose Laurel, okay, the puppet president. Now we go to the third Philippine Republic. This was already um, after the Japanese regime. Social and economic development was pushed. And of course, there are several educational advancements. I'm going to discuss this in the last focus that we have. Now, of course, uh, the, the president during the third Republic was Manuel Rojas, which is or who is the Lolo of Marojas, okay? So he is the president of the Third Republic. Now, under the new society, the new society was already under the former president Marcos. And here, Department of Education and Culture was established in 1972, which was later on changed to the Ministry of Education and Culture in 1978. Okay, so they established or they created 13 regional offices for education and there was a major organizational change okay there were lots of organiz organizational changes during um the new society which was already part of the marcus regime okay so again take note 1972 department of education and culture was established and it was changed in 1978 to the name ministry of education and culture now after edsa this was already the time of the former president Corazon Aquino. We have the Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports, or MEX, in 1982, established in 1982. And it was later called Department of Education, Culture, and Sports, or DEX, in 1987. Okay, so 1982, MEX, Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports, 1987, it was changed to the Department of Education, Culture, and Sports. Now we're done with the history of Philippine education. Now we go to the last part. I, again, I would suggest that you get a piece of paper, your notebook, your pen. Also next time in our next live streams, I'd like you to please prepare your notebooks, your pen, so that of course um, there are some things that you might forget. 
And so it's going to be better if you have them on paper. So you can just easily review them once we're done with the live stream. Okay, now the last part that we have, which is also very important, also one of the most important topics in the lab would be the relevant laws in Philippine education. We start. The educational decree of 1863, this was during the Spanish period. And this was an effort by Spain to reform or to change the Philippine colonial education system. They required two elementary schools in each town. Okay, so each town, each municipality should have two elementary schools, one for girls and one for boys. They also established the normal schools. Now, when you say normal schools, these are schools for high school graduates that would want to become teachers, okay? So the normal school was established by the educational decree of 1863, an effort by Spain to change our colonial education system, giving rise to two elementary schools in each town. Okay, next, we have the Malolos Constitution in 1899. This is also called the first Philippine Constitution. It might come out in the lab. The let me ask you in the social studies what is known as the first Philippine constitution or maybe social studies major. Uh, Malolos constitution is of course known as the first Philippine constitution. It was headed by Felipe Calderon or written by Felipe Calderon Iroca and Felipe uh, Buencamino. And this gave us the free and compulsory elementary education. Now, I think I have discussed this in one of our videos where we had the actual lab questions. What is compulsory in the Philippines and free would only be elementary education. So both elementary and high school education are free, but only elementary education is compulsory. Okay, That means some people are allowed to not undergo or to not study in high school. Okay, So even if you don't study in high school, you are not going to be held uh, liable for that because it's not really compulsory to study high school in the Philippines. Only elementary is compulsory, but both elementary and high school are free. Next one, your Sherman Commission in 1899. This is also called the Second Philippine Commission, Sherman Commission. Uh, uh, no, this is the first commission, I'm sorry. This is by United States President William McKinley on January 20th, 1899. And this gave us adequate secularized and free public school system. Okay, so the left might ask you, what gave the Philippines its free public school system? Your answer would be the Sherman Commission. The left might also ask you, what is considered as the first Philippine Commission? First Philippine Commission was also the Sherman Commission. Okay, tandaan, sure na sure, ito po ang ating first Philippine Commission. So Philippine Commission, the first one would be the Sherman Commission. It was enacted upon in 1899. Now the meaning of the term secularized here would be the shift less na into religion. Okay, less na yung focus natin into religion. So adequate, secularized, and free public school system. Now the next commission, this is known as the second Philippine Commission, and that's the Taft Commission. And this gave us free primary instruction that trained the people for the duties of citizenship. Okay, so free primary instruction that trained the people the duties of citizenship that would be the second Philippine Commission is also known as the Taft Commission. Next one, we have Act Number 74 enacted upon in 1901. This gave us the centralized public school system, okay, centralized public school system. And because of this, because of the centralization of the public school system, there was a heavy shortage of teachers, which resulted to the arrival of the Thomasites. Okay, dahil po sinentralized na ang public school system sa Pilipinas, nagkaroon po ng shortage ng number of teachers dahil kinailangan ng maraming guro. And so what happened was that the Americans sent 600 people to become teachers and they were called thomasites. Now this is a very common answer so uh, question sa let mo no pag sinabing thomasites this was or these were the first teachers in the Philippines. Okay? First uh, they they were considered the first teachers in the Philippines. They were called thomasites because they embarked or disembarked from the MSS 
Thomas. Okay, pangalan po ng barko yung Thomas. MSS uh, Thomas, yung pangalan ng barko kung saan sila sumakay, papunta ng Pilipinas, and so they were called the Thomasites. Now, the Thomasites were not really teachers. Most of them were soldiers. Okay, so sila po yung nagpuro sa ating mga lolo at lola. Kung inyo pong natatandaan or kung meron pa kayong mga buhay na lolo at lola and they were uh, of school age during the time of the Americans, uh, inyo pong napapansin that they are very good at speaking the language. They're very good at speaking English, okay? Because they learned from the Americans, okay? So that's act number 74, brought us the Thomasites and gave us centralized public school system. Next one, act number 1870 in 1908, very important because this created the University of the Philippines. Okay, so the University of the Philippines, if you can see in the oblation, under that you have, um, you have the year 1908 because that was the time that was the, the University of the Philippines or UP was established. Okay, act number 1870. Next one, Commonwealth Act 578 or 578 acted upon in 1940. This is also very important in education because this included teachers, professors, and persons charged with the supervision of schools within the term of persons in authority. So ito po yung kauna-unahang law na nagbigay ng status na persons in authority sa ating mga guro. That's Commonwealth Act 578, 578 in 1940. All right, we go to the next slide, and this is Commonwealth Act 586, still in 1940. This is also a very relevant education law because it reduced the number of years in elementary education. So from seven years, hanggang grade seven ang elementary, naging hanggang grade six na lamang. So until now, hanggang grade six na lang ating elementary. It also fixed school entrance age at seven years old. Okay, so students would start learning uh, at seven years old. It also gave us the double, double single sessions. Ano ba tong double single sessions? Under the double single sessions, the teacher is going to have uh, two sessions that they have to teach in one day. Okay? So yan yung tinatawag natin double single session. So may dalawang session na kailangang turuan ng guro sa isang araw. Okay, so that's a double single session, fixed school age at seven years old, reduce the number of years in elementary until grade six only. That's Commonwealth Act 586 in 1940. Next one, EO or Executive Order number 94, 1947. This changed the name of Department of Instruction to Department of Education. So Department of Instruction was changed to Department of Education. That's EO number 94 in 1947. Now we go to the next slide that we have RA 416 in 1941, the, uh, 1949, I mean. This is Republic Act 416. And it changed the Philippine normal, sis, uh, normal school's name to Philippine Normal College. Okay, so of course now we know this to be Philippine Normal University. Okay, so PNS was changed to PNC. That's RA416 enacted upon in 1949. Next one, RA-1265, this was in 1955, and this gave us a compulsory daily flag ceremony. Okay, so araw-araw may flag ceremony. This was based on RA-1265, Republic Act 1265, 1955. Now, there are so many laws, but I'm only, I have only included those relevant ones that I know would be coming out in your lab. Okay, so make sure again that you have your pen and paper with you. Make sure that you are taking down notes and that you also would review that once you go home. Um, hindi lamang na kinopya nyo, pero pinabayaan nyo din, hindi nyo din review okay? So make sure that you go over your notes and that you have your notes every time that we have our lesson. Next one, RA1425 enacted upon in 1956. This is known as the Rizal Law. Okay, so this told us or this gave the permission to all colleges, universities, all schools to study um, the works uh, the life works and writings of Rizal. So included na dito yung ating El Filibusterismo, no Limitangere, sa high school. And of course, uh, yung Rizal na subjects natin sa ating college. Okay, so that's RA 1425, 1956, also known as the Rizal Law. Next one, RA 4670. 
1966. This is very important. This is called the Magna Carta for Public School Teachers. Yung hawak lamang nito, sa lamang po nito ay yung mga public school teachers not included are those people in private schools. Now, one of you has also requested for me to talk about the Magna Carta for Public School Teachers. Abangan po ninyo sa mga susunod nating uh, live stream, sa mga susunod nating video. I'll be talking about Magna Carta, the Philippine Constitution, and also the Code of Conduct for Public School Teachers those things, those parts that would be coming out in the lab. Okay, so yung usual questions na kinukuha or um, makikita nyo sa lab based on this um, legal basis of education. Okay, so RA4670 is a Magna Carta for Public School Teachers. Now, PD1081 in 1972, this gave us the Department of Education and Culture. This was already mentioned in our new society kanina sa history ng ating Philippine education. So it's in 1972, and this was PD or Presidential Decree 1081. Next one is PD 1006 in 1976. This called teachers professionals and also considered teaching as a profession. So during the, um, the passage of PD or Presidential Decree 1006 in 1976, now the teachers needed to pass the PBET for them to be considered as professional teachers. So PBET po, um, Professional Board of Education or professional board examination for teachers which was then given by the civil service commission so hindi pa po siya under ng le uh, ng, ng prc i mean it was not called the let yet it was called pbet and it was given by the civil service commission okay so that's under pd 1006 now next is pd number 1397 in 1978 uh, this gave us the Ministry of Education and Culture. So, meron na tayong tinatawag na minister. This was the start of the Ministry of Education and Culture. This was under President Marcos. We also have Education Act of 1982. This is also known as BP, Batas Pambansa 232, which gave us Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports. I've already mentioned this. Uh, this was already part of Cory Aquino's administration. And this established and maintained an integrated system of education in the Philippines. Okay, so Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports, BP 232, Education Act of 1982. Next one. We have RA 6655 in 1988, which gave us the free public secondary education, or this is also called the Free Public Secondary Education Act of 1988. So that's RA 6655. Next one is EO number 117 in 1987, Executive Order number 117. I've also uh, mentioned this a while ago. It's Department of Education, Culture, and Sports. All right, next. Now, uh, basically, this did not change until 1994. Okay, so Department of Education, Culture, and Sports stayed that way until 1994. So in 1994, because of the Congressional Commission on Education, which is called EDCOM, there was the passage of two very important republic acts, RA-7722 and RA-7796. 7722 is your Commission on Higher Education or CHED, and your RA-7796 would be your TESDA, Technical Education and Skills Development Authority. Okay, so those were just established in 1994 based on the Congressional Commission on Education or EDCOM. Okay, so RA7722 is CHED. RA7796 would be TESDA. Next one, 1994 still, you have RA7836, also known as the Teachers Professionalization Act. Okay, so dahil sa yung Teachers Professionalization Act in 1994, RA7836, dahil dito, kailangan mo mag-take ng let sa September. Okay, or kailangan mo mag-take ng let sa mga susunod na buwan, sa susunod na taon. Okay, so teachers are only going to be considered professional teachers are um, going to be granted their license once they pass the licensure examination for teachers, the let, which is now established or given by the PRC. Okay, so under PRC na po, hindi na under sa CSC or Civil Service Commission. Next one, RA7877-1995. This is your Anti-Sexual Harassment Act in Employment 
education or training environment. So, uh, be very wary, be very careful po. Huwag kayong magsabi ng kung ano-anong comment sa inyong mga co-teachers. Baka para sa inyo, eh, joke lang. Yun pala, eh, they're taking it seriously at baka ma-offend sila at mag-file sila ng anti-sexual, na, na sexual harassment. Okay, so sexual harassment. Anti-sexual harassment is RA-7877, which was formed in 1995. Next one, RA-9155 in 2001. This is known as the Governance of Basic Education Act, which changed DEX to DEPED. Okay, so this part here is very important. The let might ask you, what uh, legal basis changed the name of Department of Education, Culture, and Sports to Department of Education? Okay, so that would be RA-9155, which was in 2001. So from DEX, Department of Education, Culture, and Sports, naging DEP-ED na lang po siya, or Department of Education. So now the culture part was given to your National Commission of Culture and the Arts, or National Commission Culture of the, uh, Culture and the Arts, which is NCCA. Okay, so lahat ng culture na part ng DEX dati ay napunta na sa NCCA, National Commission of Culture and the Arts, and yung sports naman ay napunta sa PSC. Okay? PSC is the Philippine Sports Commission. Okay? So that's the changing of DEX to DEPED, RA-9155 in 2001. Now next, uh, second to the last slide na tayo, we have RA-10533 enacted upon in 2013, this is called the Enhanced Basic Education Act, which is also called the K-12 law. Okay, so this gave us a K-12 curriculum. Okay, so K-12, in 2013, under the President Noinoy Aquino, this was RA-10533. And the last act that we have here, RA-10627, still in 2013, and this is called the Anti-Bullying Act. Okay, sa bawal na po ang bullying sa ating mga schools, especially elementary schools and high schools, especially basic education, no? doon po malimit ang pambubuli kasi nga yung mga students natin ay hindi pa ganun kamature. So RA 10627 is your anti-bullying act. All right, so that ends our discussion today. Uh, that's my my quote, no? Palagi nyo itong na, naririnig from me. Okay, now... We're going back to our live stream. Okay, so that ends our discussion today. So again, make sure that you subscribe, you like our video, you also follow our Facebook page, follow our Instagram Instagram account, and you share all the videos that we have. Please do come back. And sa susunod po nating live stream, ay magbibigay na po kami ng mga papremyo. Okay? So, the next live stream that we have, I will call it Learn and Earn. Okay? So, Learn and Earn, I will be giving you thousands of pesos because, of course, we all know that we need money right now. Okay? So, sa susunod na live stream, we will be giving you... Um, the chance to win cash, okay, since we all know that we need cash right now in this time of pandemic. So again, thank you so much sa lahat po ng nag-comment. Let me check all the comments that you have. Okay, so there is Ma'am Early Lauron, salamat. Uh, Ma'am Annalisa de la Cruz, King Ray, HMD, Ma'am Gemaline, wash hands. Sir Dennis, okay, so these are the usual people that I'd always see commenting, okay, so thank you so much. Hi, ma'am, napakasarap pakinggan yung boses mo. Thank you, sir, Jenny Mar. Uh, if you think that I, I'm talking so fast, then make sure that you also comment that. So thank you, ma'am KD. Ma'am Marites, thank you po. Palagi ka rin nagko-comment at nag-email sa akin. Ma'am KD, thank you so much. Ma'am Jolina, yes, I have seen your, your comments several times. We also have Ma'am Senorita, uh, Sir George Morla, thank you so much for watching. Sir King Ray, yes, thank you so much. So again, next time, I will be using your comments as basis for those people who are watching the live stream, and we are going to have a raffle at the end of the live stream, okay? So next time, we are going to give you, uh, we'll see, if we'll have more 
uh, people coming and watching the live stream, then we can have more more money to give away. Okay, so maybe we can have five thousand pesos as our giveaway next time. I would have to check with my husband. All right, so sa muli, ito pong inyong Gurung Pinoy. Maraming salamat sa inyong pakikinig at sa inyong pagpunta sa aming channel today. Make sure that you subscribe, hit that bell button, and also hit that like button. Follow us on Facebook and also on Instagram. Going to, um, we are going to be updating you of our next videos. Mama Nisa, thank you so much. Uh, sa muli, ito pong inyong Gurung Pinoy na nagsasabing maliit man na butil ng mga kaalaman. Ang dulo nito ay malaking kaginhawaan. Thank you so much. Good evening, good night from South Carolina, USA. I will see you in our next video. Stay safe and stay COVID-free, mga kaguro. Thank you. <laughs>